Physical Gold Fund presents The Gold Chronicles with Jim Rickards and Alex Stanzik. Insights and analysis about economics, geopolitics, global finance and gold. Hello, this is Alex Stanzik, and I have with me today the brilliant Mr. Jim Rickards. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Alex. Great to be with you. And so today, of course, we're doing another edition of our Gold Chronicles podcast. In our last podcast, we covered a wide range of topics um, uh, from institutional allocations in gold to an analysis of how uh, U.S. war fighting policymakers are looking at the North Korea situation and much more. If you want to hear any of our previous podcasts, the entire archive is available at physicalgoldfund.com slash podcasts. So let's dive into our topics. The first topic is going to be, um, as we often do, we're going to have a little discussion on gold. And some of this material uh, may seem a little remedial to some, but a lot of people ask me about these foundational concepts and I continue to find that in the financial professional space in particular, gold's utility value is widely misunderstood or it isn't understood at all. So for purposes of kind of hitting on some of the basic education concepts here, um, we're going to talk about some of this. Let's break it down into first principles basics. And when I say first principles, what I mean by that is uh, it's based a method of reasoning where we're going to start with what we absolutely know to be true. We're going to start with the facts and go from there. Instead of theorizing about gold being a good investment or gold being, um, you know, a, a gold standard or anything like that, we're just going to start with what we absolutely know. So, number one, we're going to start with how wealth is created and in its most basic level. Um, what we're talking about here is, is that a, a person, an individual can expend their labor. Uh, another way to look at that is to say that they're investing energy. And from this, they're, they're creating either some kind of good or a service that, that has a, um, a value in the marketplace that somebody or, or some entity is willing to, to buy. And uh, so we create wealth uh, or energy doing this and up and above what we require for our basic needs. In other words, you know, how we pay for where we live, what we eat, the clothes on our backs, just basic necessities to survive. Anything in excess of that is wealth. So it's a surplus of energy is one way to look at it. So that's the first part. The second part, this moves us on to now that we've created some wealth, now that we have a little bit of surplus excess energy, the next part is, okay, so what do we do with that surplus or excess energy? You can either invest it or you can store it in money. So the next thing is money what is money and jim i mean this is all super remedial stuff i know bear with me we're getting to the good stuff here in just a minute sure but, <laughs> but money you know we go back to the basic economics textbooks where money is essentially a couple of different things medium of exchange unit of measure uh, a way to store value we've we've heard all of those kind of things but essentially and that last one is the thing that i want to i want to talk about the most for this for this segment here is is that it's a storehouse of value or a storehouse of energy. And this is where uh, gold utility value comes into play. See, gold stores value um, and that is, in fact, its utility value is that not only does it store value, it's the way it does it. It, it stores energy in a form that's basically indestructible. And that's the key. I'll say that again. Gold's utility value is the fact that it stores energy in a form that's essentially indestructible. Unlike anything else you can invest money in or store money in, gold doesn't rely on any external force for that to continue to be true over time. It's sort of like a a battery with no expiration date. Jim, what are you what are your thoughts on these sort of first principle topics that we just talked about here? Well, I certainly agree with your articulation of that, Alex. Uh, as you know, I covered uh, a lot of the same ground, not not everything you just mentioned, but some of the same ground in Chapter 10 of my first book, uh, Currency Wars, where I advanced the 
concept that uh, uh, what you call the battery theory, which I think is a good one, which is uh, money is stored energy. I think we, we need to separate two things. What is money? How can we think about the definition of money? And then what is gold's utility as money? Uh, obviously, there are many forms of money other than gold. I happen to think gold is a particularly good form of money, which has, uh, of course, been around for a long time, and I expect it will reemerge uh, in the not too distant future as a preferred form of money. Um, but uh, but let's just talk about money first, and then come to gold and, and its utility. Um, and money, uh, I think, is is stored energy. The the three things you mentioned, the, the classic economist definition of money. And you know, economists don't agree on much. Uh, they like to disagree, but this is one of the things that they all agree on. I've never heard too much uh, dissent, which is that there's a three-part definition of money. One is store of value, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Another one is unit of account, just a way of you know counting things: how much do we make, how much do we have, um, et cetera. And then the other one is a medium of exchange, meaning we can use it to get other things. Um, the the uh, of the three of them, the unit of account is is probably the least important. It's not unimportant, but anything can be a unit of account. It could be, you know, soybeans or jelly beans or baseball cards or Bitcoin for that matter. So, uh, you know, Bitcoin's a unit of account. It's how many Bitcoins do you have and, and so forth. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, unit of account is kind of an easy one. Uh, but medium of exchange and store of value are are really the heart of it and much more difficult. So medium of exchange uh, really depends on confidence. You know, I lecture quite a bit around the world on money and one of my uh, slide, you know, in, in my slide deck, I'll, I'll put up 10 forms of money and, you know, you'll see gold and silver, but you'll also see, you know, digital, like a credit card and a Bitcoin and um, beads and feathers and shells and I make the point that all those things have been money some of them still are but have been money at one time or another and then people say well it's not backed by anything and my point is yes it is it's all backed by one thing which is confidence um, forget about intrinsic value I'll talk about that in a second but you know intrinsic value and what's behind it it's backed by confidence and, and this is something that Paul Volcker said and I, I completely agree so if I have something I think is money and you think it's money, and we both think that somebody else over there thinks it's money, and I give it to you for goods or services, and you're you're confident that you can give it to somebody else for goods and services, and they're confident that if they take it, it'll be they'll be able to to spend it as well or use it as well. Then it's money. Uh, and again, it could be feathers. Uh, it has been in certain, you know. Um, indigenous uh, tribes around the world uh, and you know maybe it was a small community and maybe it didn't last too long but there was a time when clamshells and feathers were money and so it, it's all based on confidence so then the question is how do you gain confidence and what could destroy it that's that's how i think about money um and when i think about gold it has gained confidence over thousands of years and it's almost impossible to destroy it's funny uh if you you uh, I have some grandchildren uh, kind of in the you know five six seven year old range and you know they're, they're great because they're they're curious and and inquisitive about everything and uh, if you show them a gold coin they they just have like a like an instinctive natural like oh yeah that's they they just get it uh, you know Picasso said if we could all paint like children we'd we'd all be like Picasso um, and uh, I think if a lot of our PhD monetary economists if they could understand the intuitive appeal of gold a little bit better it would it would have a greater role but so so gold is a very f good form of money in the sense that it maintains confidence right now uh, people have confidence in the U S dollar but uh, we've seen uh, you know so called fiat currencies come and go. Um, Bitcoin, I don't know who's that confident in. It's, it's an interesting speculation uh, for a lot of people, but I'm not sure it, it, it has much confidence behind it when push comes to shove. Now, the third thing uh, we talked about, store of value, uh, and that gets to the, the battery uh, metaphor, which I think is a good one. And uh, I view it really as a form of stored energy. And that's important because you can then use physics and um, uh, dynamic systems analysis and energy equations and energy mathematics to begin to understand money. So, mm -hmm. so how do you get how do you get money? Well, one way you get it is you work. Um, and well, what do you do when you work? And whether you don't you don't have to be out you know digging uh, pipeline ditches or in, in the winter you could be a uh, you know a writer or uh, a lawyer or you know any white collar profession. But you but you're you're spending time, effort, and energy, whether it's brain power, physical power 
gas in your car to get to work, uh, electric lights in the office, whatever it is, you're expending energy mm -hmm. and they give you money, whether, you know, fees or, you know, royalties or paycheck or whatever it is. So now you have the money, you've in effect stored up your the energy that you exerted in acquiring it. You can then release the energy by hiring someone to work for you. Uh, mm -hmm. You get your house painted, you know, you hire the painter, the painter comes in and he works really hard or she works really hard and you give that person the money. So the, the money that you have is uh, it's stored up the energy that you use to acquire it and then you can release energy from third parties by spending it or, or investing it. And so it fits that energy battery you know, the, the, the energy comes from somewhere, whether it's burning oil or natural gas or the sun, it goes into a battery um, and then it's stored there and then it's released later on to run a light bulb or power a, a tool or whatever it may be. So that that's more than a metaphor. It's actually a pretty exact parallel. So, so the store value is it stores up uh, energy spent acquiring it and it can release energy for your own goods and services. The medium of exchange, uh, basically spending it, is, is depend, depends on confidence. And the unit of account, that's a little less important, but yeah, you can use it to count with. So with all those things said, um, what is uh, the utility of gold uh, as a form of money compared to other forms of money? Now here we, we get into the economic history of value. Uh, and David Ricardo was the one of the first, if not the first, economists in the early 19th century to res wrestle with the theoretical concept of value. I mean, they had, they had markets since, uh, you know, ancient Greece and Rome, and uh, for that matter, uh, in, in the Bronze Age. So markets are nothing new. Uh, and people have been exchanging money for goods and, and value all along. But uh, Ricardo wanted to understand it on a theoretical level. And he said, well, the way you value something is uh, figure out all the inputs. Um, what were the raw materials? What was the energy uh, used to acquire it? Um, you know, how much labor was involved, et cetera. Add them all up. And then that was the, the value. And that was the theory of intrinsic value. Uh, you hear that a lot, by the way, when people are talking about money, it says it has no intrinsic value. Let me come back to that. But but Ricardo was the author of this theory of intrinsic value. Then uh, about 30 years later, Karl Marx comes along and he agreed with Ricardo. He said, yeah, that's, that's one way to think about it. It's intrinsic value. But the intrinsic value comes from labor and capital. And the capitalists own the, what they call the means of production. So you own the factory or the bank or whatever it might be, the railroad, whatever it might be. And labor works for them and, and gets a wage. And Marx's critique was that capital captures the surplus value of labor. Now, as labor doesn't get its fair share, the capitalist gets more than his fair share. Uh, and that, sur that surplus labor theory is, is the, his critique of capitalism. And of course, that led to communism and, and all that. So, um, so basically, Marx took Ricardo's uh, uh, theory of value, which was intrinsic value, and created the surplus labor theory of value, but it was still relying on intrinsic value. So now come forward another 30 years, and we get to University of Vienna, 1870s, Karl Menger, the father of Austrian economics, and he said nonsense. Um, the whole uh, intrinsic theory, surplus labor theory of value is, is all nonsense. He said something... Uh, he created what's called the subjective theory of value. And he said something is worth basically what other people think it's worth. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, you know, it's a, you know it's, a, it's a subjective thing that can vary over time. And of course, that was the basis for markets and price discovery. Like I said, we've had markets throughout the history of civilization. But again, the, the theoretical basis for the role of markets, the benefit of capitalism and what we call price discovery is that it, it allows people to explore you know, bids and offers and, and preference curves and subjectively value things. And that's mm -hmm. been the prevailing view in economics ever since. And whether you're a Keynesian or in the neo-Keynesian consensus or a monetarist or an Austrian, what, all schools of economics now agree that, that Menger's subjective theory of value is the right way to think about it. Um, and so, so when people say a currency has – Intrin doesn't have intrinsic value. I say, who cares? If so what? I mean, that's, that's I, I compliment them on their firm grasp of Marxian economics, but I say it's it's a completely irrelevant concept. It's been discarded. It's part of uh, you know economic the, the theory uh, the theory of economic history, but it really plays no role in how we think about value today. And the subjective value really prevails. So now that brings us into the 21st century and. 
when we talk about subjective value, we're back to the first thing I mentioned, which is confidence. Now, right. this is why this is why currencies rise and fall, because uh, you lose confidence in the issuer, you lose confidence in the central bank, or you gain confidence uh, by its performance in a crisis. This is one of my critiques of Bitcoin. You know, I get I get beaten up on uh, social media and Twitter all all day long because my critique of Bitcoin and I, people say, you know, you're you're a Neanderthal, you're a dinosaur, you don't understand technology, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, in my, my snarkier moments, I remind them that I was I was writing code before they were born. Uh, so I, I understand the code uh, perfectly well. I understand the technology perfectly well. I've read the technical papers. Uh, I've actually been at the uh, – uh, the IBM's lab, you know, private laboratories where they're working on something that's going to blow uh, existing forms of blockchain away. Um, it's now being adopted by the Linux Foundation called Hyperledger Fabric version 1.0. It was released last summer. But uh, that aside, uh, I, I get the technology, but I, I wonder whether the techies understand money, uh, understand money in the right. terms we're, we're talking about it right now. And one of the things I point out is that Bitcoin has never had a stress test. Um, it was created in 2009 after the last crisis. Uh, and I've lived through a series of crises, whether it was the, the 87 crash or the mid, you know, the mid 80s emerging markets crisis, the 87 crash tw down 20% in one day, the Mexican tequila crisis in 94, certainly the Asia LTCM crisis in 97, 98, um, the dot-com crash, the, the mortgage crisis of 07, the financial panic of 08. You see enough of these things, you kind of you know get a feel for them and, and see them coming. Bitcoin hasn't seen any of that, and it's had a lot of uh, uh, adoption from uh, millennials and uh, you know i love millennials they've got three millennial children they're they're i think some of the brightest and most creative people on earth but uh you know we're, we're all we all know what we know put it that way and if you've never uh, lived through a panic as an adult or as an investor or with someone with with something to lose uh you don't you don't you're not acquainted with that sick feeling in the pit of your stomach when you're watching markets go down and they seem to have no bottom so they uh so Bitcoin has never been through a panic. It's never been through a recession. It's never been through a liquidity crisis. Uh, leave aside all the other technical difficulties. We don't have time today to, to go through them all. There are many. But but that's one thing in particular I would caution the Bitcoin fans. Is, uh, you're, you're dealing with something that where, it, where confidence in it has never been tested. Uh, all the other forms of money we're discussing, uh, despite their strengths and weaknesses, they, they've been stress tested uh, one way or another. So when you, when you take – Everything we've just discussed, um, gold has enormous utility uh, for the reason you mentioned. I, I'm always amazed at the the physical, chemical, um, and atomic properties of gold, uh, which I've studied. It's you know, first of all, it's an element, atomic number seventy nine. It's not some kind of compound. It's practically indestructible. You have you do have to blow it up with high explosives, and even then, all you really do is just spread the molecules or you spread sure. the atoms around, and they fall to the ground, and somebody will dig it up at you know ten thousand years from now. But you you can't actually destroy it. Right, um, the gold and, molecules and are still gold molecules, right? Just they're still in smaller yeah, they're, pieces. They're, the the atoms right exactly and uh, uh, in fact uh, as, as you know in the gold refining process they use um, you know historically these mercury and now they use cyanide but the the, the reason they use cyanide is it, because it dissolves everything except the gold uh, you you get you get sort of a, a fine powder through the milling process and it's got gold and other stuff in it uh, and you, you just kind of reduce it to a liquid and you pour in some cyanide and all the other stuff dissolves and there's the gold and you scoop it up it's that's it's precisely its indestructibility that makes it possible to extract from from the ore um and uh, it's it's more than stood the test of time uh and uh it people have confidence in it now it's not uh well i say it's not a form of money today in the sense that uh, you know, central banks hate it. Uh, finance ministries hate it. You won't find any of the international monetary elites who have a kind word to say about gold. Uh, but then I say, well, well, if that's true, why does the IMF have a thousand tons? Sure. Why does the United States have eight thousand tons? Why does Germany have three thousand tons? Why have Russia and China tripled their gold reserves in the last ten years? China probably more so. If it has no utility as money, well, well, the answer is, of course, it has utility, uh, but nobody wants to talk. Well, the elites don't want to talk about it. They want to scoop up the gold for themselves sure. and leave and leave everyday citizens and, and investors out in the cold. Yeah, they hate it and they don't hate it. Right. It's it's uh, um, 
comes down to watch what they do and not what they say. They're 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 right. saying on one hand that it's useless and it and that that we only you know if you if you think back to Bernanke's um, testimony before Congress uh, before the congressional panel, he was basically saying we keep it because of tradition. But at the same okay. time, uh, you know, you have central banks around the world, and the facts are they're stockpiling it. They're not they're not getting right. rid of it right now. Exactly, and uh, yeah. So if you know, if I had a printing press that could print money, I probably and I had a monopoly position such as the Federal Reserve, I probably wouldn't want people to look at the competition either. Uh, but uh, but we're not in that position. We can be objective. We can be analytical. Uh, and uh, yeah, do do as I do, not as I say. And if, uh, um, although the, uh, it, interestingly, the one global leader who has been candid about this is our friend uh, Vladimir Putin, who um, is acquiring gold hand over fish. You know, the, well, Russia is an interesting case study because from 2000, it's a petro state. It's, it's, I think, the number one oil exporter in the world. And in 2014, the price of oil collapsed. And that continued through um, 2015 into 2016 before it kind of stabilized. And Russia's reserve position crashed along with it. It went, from, you know, I'll use round numbers, from approximately a little over $500 billion to a little over $300 billion. So they lost 60% of the reserves or uh, – uh, sorry, forty percent of their reserves, or um, or two hundred billion dollars. That entire time, they not only did not sell an ounce of gold, they continued to acquire it at a rate of you know five, ten, sometimes as many as thirty tons a month, which as you know is a lot of gold. It's quite a um, bit. So yeah, so they were selling treasuries, they were selling euros, they were selling German debt, they were selling whatever they needed to um, uh, to create liquidity in Russia and. And um, and deal with their balance of payments outflows, but they never sold gold, and they kept buying more, and that was clearly a green light. That was uh, Avira Navalina, who's the head of the Central Bank of Russia, my favorite central banker, um, and uh, but that was clearly green lighted by Putin. That would would not have been happening if, if Putin didn't want it to. So, despite the stress, they they continued to buy gold, and so clearly it is a monetary asset. The other case study is our friend Alan Greenspan. Now Greenspan. As you know, I think a lot of our listeners know, you go back to the 1960s, early 70s, he was a strong, outspoken advocate for gold, a gold standard, gold as money, uh, a bit of an acolyte of Ayn Rand uh, at the time. And then uh, since retiring as head of the central bank, head of the Fed in 2007, he's been out on the speaking circuit saying – kind things about gold. He appeared at the gold <laughs> conference and right. uh, occasionally shows up at these gold conferences where, you know, I, uh, I, I'm i sometimes invited to speak, et cetera. So it's like, oh, that's interesting. Before you were a central banker, you love gold. Since you retired as a central banker, you love gold. It's <laughs> only when you put on your central banker clothes. But even then, query when all the when all is said and done, uh, and you won't get, you won't really get this out of Sebastian Malaby's um, biography of uh, Greenspan, and I like Sebastian, it's kind of a definitive biography. You won't get this in his book. But if you look at the price of gold between uh, you know, during uh, Greenspan's um, tenure as chairman of the Fed, it traded in a narrow range. Uh, now, it started to spike up after 02, but that's because Greenspan kept – that was the famous episode. Between 02 and 07, Greenspan kept rates too low, too long. He did that because he was worried about uh, deflation. So – and then gold, as we know, had a fabulous run uh, in those years. But that, if you leave that episode aside and look at the um, 80s and the 90s, gold traded in a pretty narrow range. It was not. It was not. It was kind of between 200 and 400 dollars an ounce. Um, that. It had its ups and downs, but it did not break out to the upside or the downside outside of that range. And it's almost as if uh, Greenspan was on a shadow gold standard, saying, you know, if, if gold gets a little pricey, maybe I'll tighten a little bit. And if it gets is in 94 and if it gets a little low, maybe I'll ease up a little bit. I, I, My view is that he was operating on a shadow gold standard even when he was Fed chair. I just couldn't say so. Well, you understood it, right? I mean, I've got his quote right here in front of me. I'm going to read it real quick. Fed Chairman Greenspan wrote in his article, Gold and Economic Freedom. Gold and economic freedom are inseparable. In the absence of the gold standard, there is no way to protect savings from confiscation through inflation. Gold stands as the protector of property rights. If one grasps this, one has no difficulty in understanding the status antagonism towards the gold standard. 
I absolutely agree. A brilliant and succinct uh, statement. And, you know, people kind of lament the fact that we're not on a gold standard today. And my answer is, what are you waiting for? Put yourself on a personal gold standard. Why are you waiting for, why are you waiting for central banks and countries to uh, you know, reinstitute a gold standard or use gold as a reference for monetary policy? Uh, you can take dollars or euros or yen today and go buy all the gold you want or you know, whatever allocation you want. Um, and so, again, that's – um, that's putting, I call putting yourself on a personal gold standard. You don't have to wait for governments to lead the way. Yep, very much so. Okay, so one more quick thing on um, the uniqueness and utility value of gold, and then we'll move on to our next topic. Um, but I was, you know, while we were talking about, about uh, how gold really doesn't rely on any external force for it continue to to have value basically because it, because it's indestructible i mean as long as humans agree that gold has value the thing is is it is it completely resists entropy um and is indestructible something that that i was thinking of is is that you had this little twitter exchange the other day somebody tweeted at you jim they said ai systems won't be using gold and you you kind of quipped back you said gold won't be using the power grid <laughs> exactly <laughs> i thought that was hilarious i was like that is that is precisely the point and i would take it even a step further than saying you know it's not just good money but if you think of any kind of investment if we do like a quick thought experiment here's a little challenge for you can you think of any form of storing wealth whether it be an investment in stocks bonds companies real estate anything bitcoin anything that is not subject to entropy over time and by entropy what i mean is Everything else requires human effort and interaction to maintain in some way or another. If we talk about bit gold, you require electricity, you require the internet, you require computers. These things all require maintenance. Companies require maintenance. Uh, fiat issued currencies, all of this requires human will and interaction to resist the forces of entropy. Otherwise, they just slowly will self-destruct over time. And the only thing that doesn't do that, as far as I can think, is gold. Can you think of anything, Jim? that you can invest in that's not subject to entropy over time. No, in fact, uh, I, I agree with that. Even uh, even silver, I mean, I'm a friend of silver. I have uh, a silver long side of gold. And silver has some practical, we've been talking about utility, uh, in, um, in, in a real crisis where, you know, Kim Jong-un has detonated an electromagnetic pulse weapon in the high atmosphere of the United States, or, you know, the power grid's down. The power grid could go down for reasons nothing have nothing to do with North Korea or EMP weapons, as we saw in uh, 2003. Um, and, um, you know, in that world where the ATMs don't work, your credit cards don't work, your debit cards don't work, you can't get on to online banking payment systems, you can't even fill up your car with gasoline because gasoline pumps require electricity, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, civilization has a very thin veneer. It lasts about three days. Three days is when you run out of food and water and the society pretty quickly devolves into um, looters and vigilantes. Um, and we've and we've seen this. I'm not talking about the Wild West. We've, we saw this in the days after Katrina. We saw it in Puerto Rico um, very recently and, and really all over the world. Um, and gold will be money. There's no question that gold will be money. But it, it's even an ounce of gold. And if you're out to get a couple of days groceries, uh, an ounce of gold might be you know a year's worth of groceries. And you, you don't want to sit there with a, with a file and chip off a little piece. But if you have a silver uh one ounce silver coin that's probably the right amount to go get your family a couple of days worth of groceries and people go people won't accept it i said of course they will Are you kidding um you know, one of the ironies of puerto rico is um in that tragedy after hurricane uh, maria uh a lot of the shelves were were bare they were stripped bare because people had bought right. stuff in advance but there were some places that had stuff on the shelves they had water they had food but nobody had any money uh, you couldn't, you could, like you said, the ATMs don't work. I, mean, I thought it was interesting. Uh, uh, Bill, uh, Bill Dudley, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and you know, as you know, uh, Alex, the Federal Reserve System is 12 regions, each of which have a certain piece of territory. Well, it so happens that Puerto Rico is under the second district, which is. Um, which is the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, and Boston's the first district. Um, and uh, so, so Dudley, as president of the New York Fed, had responsibility for Puerto Rico. He chartered planes and flew pallets of, of 
bills, like hundred dollar bills, uh, to Puerto Rico as fast as they could to pass them out through tellers and load up the ATMs when the power came back on, et cetera. They were literally out of money. But there were there were stores with provisions that people desperately needed, and they literally didn't have a way to pay because of course the credit and debit cards didn't work, et cetera. I dare say if you'd walked in with five you know, five ounces of silver and said, uh, uh, give me a hundred bucks worth or whatever, the, that merchant would have gladly taken it. So, uh, and even in even more dire circumstances, even more so. So having said that, silver is not um, as scarce, uh, not as uh, robust as gold and gold is, is the best. So I think you're, you're absolutely right about the uniqueness of gold. Yeah, silver is still... Uh, <clears throat> interacts with oxygen right oxidizes over time so yeah to it to it which which gold does it gold's like the most right. inert thing uh, anybody can think of and, and by the way just one quick footnote alex i uh i did just return a couple of days ago from an extended trip in australia and along the way um i have a lot of uh, good clients down there and good friends and i did uh about 20 it was pretty grueling grueling three days i was doing six or seven a day but i did 20 one-on-one -on -one consultations with the top hedge funds and institutional investors in Australia. So I, th I think I met with about half the money uh, in Australia in terms of, you know, the, the big banks and insurance companies. And uh, I can't mention the names of clients, but you, you take the point. Um, and I detected a, a, a kind of a warming up to gold. And you don't usually hear that in the institutional investor world. Uh, unfortunately, I can't, I can't get a pulse in the United States. I think Americans are really going to be the last to know. But um, and the Russians, Russians and Chinese are easy. They they get gold. They're they're stockpiling it. Same is true in Europe, um, Austria, uh, elsewhere around the world. I think people have a good understanding of gold, um, but not, definitely not true in the United States uh, or Canada. But I was finding it in Australia. Um, you know, people who might not have even wanted to talk about it before. Yeah, you know, my. My consultation, I would cover, you know, U.S. politics and fiscal policy. And, you know, it's hard. It's, it, it's funny when I go abroad, people say, you know, we really don't understand U.S. politics. I said, well, don't feel bad. Neither do Americans. But uh, <laughs> I kind of I take them through it. And and uh, but um, uh, so, so those are my main topics. But then people say, well, well talk to me about gold. Uh, and, and I would. And I was definitely detecting some interest. So that's that's another uh, another good sign. That's fascinating. Very good. Okay, on to our next topic. Um, Jim, in our last podcast, you placed the likelihood of the Fed raising interest rates in December at about 20%. I think that call surprised a lot of people. Um, has your view on this changed since the last time we discussed it? And if so, why or why well well, I'm hanging in there, but let's uh, let's be fair to the other side. So I'm not I'm no stranger to out of consensus forecasts, as you know. I was uh, running around between March and uh, June 2016, saying that the UK would vote to leave the EU at a time when that was considered extremely unlikely, and that happened. I ran around the world in uh, October um, 2016, telling uh, television audiences on live TV and. Uh, the, the great thing about doing TV, Alex, is you have the videotape. So if someone says, oh, you never said that, I said, no, no, here's the tape. Have a look. But um, I was running around in October uh, 2016 saying Trump would win, uh, and he did. Um, and beginning that. in begin Thank you. And beginning in December 2016, I said that the Fed would raise interest rates in March 2017 at a time when the market gave it about a 30% probability. That 30% probability prevailed all through January, all through February, I was saying they would uh, raise. The market was saying they wouldn't. The market didn't believe the Fed. They were calling their bluff, et cetera. Uh, suddenly, over a course of uh, about three days at the end of February 2017, the Fed started to panic. They're like, hey, we know we're going to raise rates, but the market doesn't believe us, so we have to signal, and Yellen, Dudley, Fisher, and Brainerd, the, the four horsemen, uh, went out and gave speeches that were incredibly blunt. I said, hey, wake up. We're going to raise rates. The market got the message, and the probability went from – you can see this on a chart. It's one of those hockey stick charts. Um, the probability went from 30 percent to 90 percent in three trading days and converged on my forecast. So as I say, I'm no, I'm no stranger to being out of consensus, and I'm not uncomfortable with it if I have confidence in the model. Having said that, I am, I've never been more out of consensus because – I'm giving it a low probability. You know, maybe I've 
increase it from 20% to 30%, but I'm still, you know, way below 50. Uh, the market is actually at a hundred percent. It's not right. 90 or 95. The market's a hundred percent chance feds raising rates in, in uh, December. Uh, so, so let's see how it plays out, but it does, it does have, um, a lot of significance. Let me just spend a minute on the analysis. I, I won't belabor it, but, um, uh, the, 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 my baseline scenario, the feds on a path to raise rates four times a year, every March, June, September, December, 25 basis points each time, like clockwork through 2019 to get rates to three and a quarter percent. That's the base case. And they're doing it not because the economy is strong or because there's much inflation on the horizon. They're doing it to raise rates so they can be ready to cut them again in the next recession. And the finesse is, can you do that without actually causing the recession you're trying to cure? So that that's the big picture. I realize I ran through that quickly, but uh, people can play it twice. And uh, that that's the scenario. However, however, there are three pause factors, many quarters and uh, September 2017 was one of them. Um, but uh, the first seven meetings in 2016 were another example. There are many times when the Fed does not raise rates. So what are the conditions under which they do not raise rates despite the baseline scenario that they will? First is a disorderly market decline. Well, that's what happened in January 2016. The market dropped 10%, and the Fed did not hike in March and June of that year uh, in response to that. The second one is job creation dries up. That's that's not much of a factor. Job creation has been strong. It's it's come down from the you know, 250,000 a month to 100,000 a month, but that's still more than enough to absorb new entrants into the labor force. So as far as that, and the unemployment is 4.1%. Uh, as far as that's concerned, that's mission accomplished. The Fed's not even thinking about employment, except as it relates to the other part of the dual mandate, which is price stability. So market disruption is one, but it's not present today. Uh, a, a, an evaporation of job creation is another, but that's not present either. The third pause factor, which is present, is disinflation. Uh, the Fed has a goal of 2% uh, inflation measured using a very specific metrics, which is uh, personal consumption expenditure deflator core year over year. I realize that's a mouthful, but they're, they're all important. It's PCE, not, not PPI, not CPI, but PCE. It's specifically core, meaning exclude food and energy. And it's year over year, not month over month or quarter over quarter. So that's that. And the Fed told us that. That's not guesswork. They told us that. They have a 2% target. Um, last December uh, and last January, it was 1.9, which that came, that number came in at 1.9, which is why I said they would raise rates in March, even though the market didn't believe them. But since then, it's been flat or down nine months in a row. It's come down six tenths of 1%. It's currently at 1.3%. That was the most recent reading. Uh, and that is a, that is a flashing red light to the Fed. That's saying, hey, Fed, you're moving away from your goal. You're moving substantially and rapidly away from it. You're causing the problem with your rate hikes and your strong dollar, which is uh, deflationary. Uh, and there are a lot of voices saying, don't raise rates. Uh, Neil Kashkari, um, uh, uh, president of the Minneapolis Fed, uh, Charlie Evans, president of the Chicago Fed, Lyle Brainerd, who's on the board of governors. Um, they're all kind of no votes coming up. So. Uh, so based on that and based on the most recent readings, just sticking to my model, not, you know, I didn't break into a safe and steal any secret plans here. Um, just sticking to my model, I would say that the Fed will not raise rates in December. Now, having said that, um, there's one more reading before the meeting. The meeting's December 13th. And the next and final uh, pre-meeting PCE core year over year comes out November 30th. So uh, for our listeners, uh, 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time, November 30th, um, you know, check it out and see what the number is. And if look, if it's hot, uh, if it's one point, you know, I'm, a, I'm a good Bayesian if I get new data and it, it uh, you plug it into the equation. And if the probability goes up, it goes up. I'm not going to. Um, you know, ignore the evidence. So if it's hot, by, by that I mean 1.6, 1.7%, that will, first of all, be close to two. Secondly, it, it will validate Yellen's belief that all this other disinflation was transitory. Uh, and at that point, I'll join the crowd and you know, I'll throw in the towel and say, okay, we're, they're going to raise rates. Uh, but that's not what I expect. If it's, if it's weak, meaning 1.4, certainly 1.3 or less, 
Uh, that's going to be the last nail in the coffin, and my I, my expectation is the Fed will not raise rates. Now, from a market perspective, this sets up a very interesting uh, trading opportunity, um, which I call a, an asymmetric trade. An asymmetric trade is when a certain outcome is completely priced. The, the market's not sitting there saying, you know, 50-50, we don't know, could go either way. They, the market expectation is so high that the event – is completely priced into markets, which means that if it happens, nothing happens. And uh, right. if something's if something's priced in, and then that happens, nothing else happens to the market because you already priced it. That's what markets are supposed to do. They're supposed to discount the future. On the other hand, if it doesn't happen, you have a violent, sudden repricing as market expectations get adjusted. And the beauty of that is kind of heads I win, tails I don't lose, meaning uh, it's not that you're going to make money both ways, but you you could make a lot of money one way and not lose or get hurt the other way. So what's priced in right now? Well, as I said, 100% expectation the Fed's going to raise rates in, on December 13th. What does that mean? It means a uh, strong dollar, weak euro, weak yen, weak gold prices, uh, higher bond yields, lower treasury prices. So what happens if the Fed doesn't raise rates? What happens if that PC number is weak, meaning 1.3% or less? What happens if my analysis is correct uh, and they don't raise rates? Well, all of a sudden, every one of those trades is going to reverse. Gold's going to skyrocket. The euro is going to go from 117 to 120. Uh, Yen's going to go from you know 112 to 110. Uh, Gold's going to go from 1270 to 1300 plus. Um, dollar index is going to come down. You're going to, all these markets are going to, uh, within a day or two, uh, probably actually, what am I saying? Probably within hours, um, adjust to this new reality of the Fed just kind of not being able to raise rates. So, uh, so let's see. So, so right now, I mean, gold's been. Um, I wrote a column the other day. I said if you, uh, if you were on Mars uh, last week, you didn't miss anything. Gold went just sideways and you know, it's kind of been a little bit boring there was, there was a little bit of activity over the course of the day thursday kind of ran up and then you know fell off a cliff with one of those paper gold dumps but um but you know kind of last week it started and ended the week around 12 you know 75 right now uh, it's it's a little bit higher than that but not much but but this is what i mean see gold's not doing anything right now and neither is the dollar index or the euro they're all just sitting there you know, waiting for Godot or more accurately waiting for Janet Yellen and the FOMC. Um, but they priced in an outcome. They can't do it anymore because they, they priced in 100 percent chance. So they're just going to sit there and go sideways absent some geopolitical shock. Um, but if we, if that inflation number is weak and the Fed doesn't raise rates, then uh, it's going to be a wild uh, couple of days in, uh, in early December. Yep. All right. So. Uh, we are bumping up against our, our uh, time limit here. Um, there is one other thing that I wanted to cover here really quickly, and that is uh, moving into the realm of geopolitics. We usually uh, like to talk about something that's going on around the world and uh, more importantly, how it affects uh, global economics, how it affects markets. And the the most recent uh, thing since the last time we talked, Jim, is is this chaos that's going on right now over there in the House of Saud, or at least it it appears to be chaos from the from the outside. I mean, maybe it's all very well under control. But uh, about a week ago, we started hearing uh, news of sweeping changes taking place in Saudi Arabia. Senior ministers were being fired. Dozens of princes and other wealthy businessmen were being arrested. Assets were being frozen from all of these people valued at, at I, saw, I saw one estimate as high as 800 billion U.S. dollars worth of assets have been frozen. Um, so apparently only hours before all of this started happening, uh, King Salman decreed the creation of a new anti-corruption committee. And it's headed by the, the crown prince, the, the heir apparent, Mohammed bin Salman. MBS is what a lot of people refer to him as, uh, for right. short. Um, and and this this committee's got the power to investigate, ar arrest, ban people from traveling, and freeze assets of anyone it deems corrupt. So, like one article I read claimed that the purge against other members of the royal family is unprecedented in the kingdom's modern history, and that family unity which guaranteed the stability of the state since its foundation has been shattered. Now, Jim, what are your what are your thoughts on this? What does this mean for regional politics and how does that then go on to affect the rest of the world? 
Well, Alex, this is, uh, by the way, it's a very good, succinct um, summary. This is one of those topics we could spend uh, hours on. We could write a book on Of course, we don't have that much time, but I'll, I'll try to do the, the short version of it. You've got about uh, three minutes. <laughs> three minutes. Okay. Um, well, well, here's the thing. Uh, since the founding of the kingdom under uh, King Abdulaziz, he had, I think, 75 children by multiple wives. Uh, and so they were all brothers, sisters, well, forget the sisters. I mean, the, the women don't play a role. It's unfortunate, but that's just the case in that culture. So among the, the you know, 30 or, or so brothers who were mostly half brothers, um, they, they had a succession. So the succession of, of the kingship in Saudi Arabia did not go from father to son. It went from brother to brother. The problem was most of them died or they're in their, at this point, they're in their 80s. Uh, and they're, you know, not mentally or physically fit, et cetera. And so you're almost to the point where there are only a handful of possible um, kings, and it's got to go to the next generation. But that begs the question, which son of which half-brother is going to be the successor versus some other son of some other half-brother? And that that jockeying, that sort of house of cards, if you will, has been playing out for, for decades, but getting very, very intense now, just because of the demographics, just because they, you know, they're all going to die. And so they, they got to do something. So it's been decided uh, by the king, Salman, that his son, uh, Muhammad bin Salam, which bin just means son of, and Muhammad, son of Salman, um, is going to be the new king. And they, they give him the title of, uh, you know, crown prince. That's, that's the, the second in line. Well, that doesn't sit well with some of the other princes and some of their uh, children. And, um, and then they have all these, you know, in these kingdoms, you find multiple armies. Like there's the, 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 the regular army, let's call it. But then there's like a national guard, which is like an eternal army. Mm -hmm. Then there's that police force which is paramilitary and there's like a personal bodyguard so uh, and who's in charge of which you, you get into that but they not only arrested a lot of these uh, princes but uh one prince decided his bodyguard decided to fight it out and they got in a firefight and the guy was killed it was he was the son of a former king the uh, uh son of king afad uh so it's getting nasty over there and of course ice nine uh, my theory of freezing accounts when when you need to to control situations is is operative as it was in cyprus and greece and catalonia and a lot of other places around the world but just to um uh, just to kind of uh, to cut to the chase, uh, th this is um, a pattern we've seen before in Putin's Russia and uh, Xi Jinping's China, which is when you want to assert your power, you create a um, – you use the, 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 the judicial system, which is not – uh, objective or fair at all, but it's under your control to arrest your enemies on grounds of corruption. Now, the thing you have to understand, they're all corrupt, right? Everybody right. in Russia is corrupt. Everybody in China is corrupt. Everybody in Saudi Arabia is corrupt. That's not the point. The point is, are you with me or against me? And if you're with me, I will ignore your corruption up to a point. If you're against me, I will use the corruption to round you up and put you in jail. So that's why, uh, and the, the best statement of that was, uh, La Vrente Beria, who is the head of the NKVD secret police under Stalin, um, his motto was, um, show me the man, I'll give you the crime. Meaning right. there's nobody, you know, as John Lennon said, everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey. Um, so you can pretty much bring up anybody on charges, as Paul Manafort has found out the hard way. Uh, and, um, and so you use these corruption justice tools as a cloak to round up your enemies and disable them. Now, Will there be pushback? I, I think uh, I think MBS may have pulled this off was sufficiently fast and ruthless uh, to um, to have done it successfully. Uh, interesting there. There have been to Riyadh. I, I, was, I was in Riyadh for a few days um, when I left. I was like getting out of jail. I was like, oh. Uh, but uh, they've turned the Ritz Carlton into the world's most luxurious prison. The, the Ritz Carlton is probably the fanciest Ritz Carlin in the world and business people are very familiar with it, but they needed a place to put all these pr princes and they couldn't put them in a the regular jail. So they surrounded the Ritz Carlin with, with guards. They put paramilitary you know, men in black in the lobby and they put all the princes in the suites upstairs and they're under house arrest. But it's not, I guess if you have to, if you have to be under house arrest, they're worse places to be. So, uh, so let's see how it plays out. Uh, but, but he's moved quickly. He's moved ruthlessly. That's the way you have to do it. 
you can't have half measures because you give the other side time to rally their forces and, and push back. Um, meanwhile, you see escalating tensions with Iran. Um, Saudi Arabia's got some cards to play in Lebanon. This is not over. I think I think the, the best thing we can leave our, our listeners with, Alex, is that this is not over. And uh, it's part of what's giving a little bit of a lift to the, the price of oil. Okay, very good. Jim, we're pretty much out of time. And once again, I, I greatly appreciate uh, the discussion with you. It's been invigorating. And uh, until next time, thanks a lot, Jim. Thank you, Alex. You have been listening to The Gold Chronicles with Jim Rickards and Alex Stanzik, presented by Physical Gold Fund. Recordings can be found at physicalgoldfund.com forward slash podcasts. You can register there for news of upcoming interviews with Jim Rickards and other world-class thinkers.